Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. This episode is part two of Queers with Cancer. Last time I shared the story of my journey with cancer, and today I speak with Lance Moore. Lance is an Anderson Ferry witch, a science fiction geek, and a colon cancer survivor, as well as a Silicon Valley high-tech guy. He's also an activist in the transgender community. Today I'll speak with Lance about his journey with cancer. We'll compare and contrast stories, as well as answer questions from listeners about how we navigated this path. Hi Lance, welcome to the show. Hi Nick, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So Lance, I wanted to have you on the show because you are another person that I know in queer community who has also had a journey with cancer. And so I thought that you could start out just by giving us a snapshot of what your experience was. It was a big experience. Around, I guess it was 2017, maybe June. I was doing my annual poop test with Kaiser, which I've been doing for quite a while, as you start doing to your 40s or so. And I got a call back saying that there was blood in the stool and they wanted to do some follow-up tests. I was completely healthy. I had no indications, no symptoms. The healthiest folks I know, actually, so it was very much out of the blue. So that sent me to my first colonoscopy, which was not a lot of fun. It was mostly the prep that's not a lot of fun. The actual process is no big deal because you're kind of twilight sleep for it. And those waiting for a few days to get the results was crazy as you can imagine. So I got the phone call back from the person who did the test. It, I was like dropping off my laundry at work and it was raining, which is unusual when I'm standing out there on campus. I get this phone call and I spoke to them and they're like, oh yes, it's cancer. So it was just a freaky, then again, I can't imagine there wouldn't be any freaky circumstance in which you get that news. So I went on with my day, and Kaiser was great. Can't say enough about their proactivity. Within a month, I was on the surgeon's table. I had met with the oncologist a couple of times, and then surgery was scheduled, and they removed about six inches of the transverse colon, which is kind of the upper horizontal section. And I woke up in intensive care with an IV in both arms, and that's a crazy experience. Never see that on TV. It was amusing in a sense, right, because I'd only ever seen intensive care in films, and there I was in intensive care. It was a horrible location. The particular Kaiser I went to was a great cancer service, but their intensive care was like made in the 60s and hasn't been upgraded yet. For example, they didn't have toilets for the patients, so that was craziness. So I spent like maybe three incredibly long days there on a liquid diet, which is just horrible after a while. I did have one awesome nurse. He was kick-ass. He was just super attentive and like snuck me into the staff bathroom and then there's just tattoos which made him nervous but then I told him I had tattoos it worked out so I'm really grateful to him he was super helpful a couple of, well, I had one nurse who came in at like three in the morning to take my vitals and turned all the lights on and like seemed surprised I didn't like that but she was the only one everybody else was great so at that point the cancer was gone I've had other surgeries in my life, especially due to being trans, so I was used to that sort of recovery process, and it was less painful than some others. But as soon as I had recovered from surgery, they wanted to start me on chemo. And colon cancer, the chemo drugs are some of the worst, the most impacting. And so the doctor immediately was like, there was no going back to work. I was off for surgery, and then I was off for chemo. And they tell you what chemo is going to be like, but it's still shocking. So the first thing is, for me, they had to put a pick line in, which is this big tube that goes in your arm and then snakes up around your shoulder and down into your chest because the chemo drugs will burn out your normal arm veins and stuff. So they have to stick it in there. That process wasn't too bad. 
I had been told chemo wouldn't start out that bad and it would get much worse. And that was very much the case, but I was still like shocked the first time I had it. They tell you like, you know, avoid cold water. And I'm like, okay, it starts out minor. It'll get worse. I went to the bathroom in the middle of the first time and nearly screamed because like this warm up water in the, the sink was so bad. But, so I learned to make sure the water was warmed up. Do you mean cold water on your hands? Yes, it, both externally and internally. Like I couldn't drink water with or soda with ice in it. Everything had to be room temperature. And I've always been a big ice person, so that was a real switch. But also like cold air was a real problem. So as winter came, like last year, this time was my worst time. Like going to Panthea Con and stuff where I could be functional in public for about an hour. And that was about all I could manage. So the physical stuff was tough. I was used to being very active and I couldn't do anything besides walk my dog, but thank God for walking the dog. If it were to happen again, I would find ways to incorporate more lower body yoga, but there's, I had a lot of, I don't know what's going on. You know, I did all lots of research, but that's really different than having the experience in your body as to what's okay and what's not okay. And I felt very, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what was safe and what wasn't safe. I was being cautious. I've always been a good patient because I'm very determined to get well. And I think will is a good thing to have in these circumstances. So I kept walking the dog. I kept losing energy. But the worst part of it really was I really lost the ability to concentrate. I'm a voracious reader. And by halfway through the chemo cycle, which was seven or nine months, I couldn't read anything complex. And I couldn't read for more than about 20 minutes at a time. So I discovered these like, Irish country doctor novels by random chance and I would take about a month to read one and I couldn't even focus on TV which like you would think would be the other bomb at home but I just didn't so that the fogginess the chemo brain as they call it that was by far the worst part of it combined with bizarrely food got tougher and tougher and I remember like going out to my girlfriend's birthday party which was just a year ago and she had like 15, 20 friends or out at a restaurant and I can eat like a quarter of my hamburger. And I couldn't really talk to people for more than 30 seconds at a time. I really wanted to be there for her birthday. That's, it was just really tough. It was a tough journey. Unfortunately, another part of the lack of concentration was, you know, I've had a daily sitting practice for years and daily work and all of that pretty much went out the window. And that is something also, if I were to have to go through this again, I would make a much more concerted effort to keep that going, even if I didn't want to. I think having an established practice was really useful in the sense that I was had a habit of focusing on what was happening at the moment rather than imagining all the worst things, you know, and staying in the moment is a better way to get through pain and a lot of uncomfortable situations. But I wish I had. I found a way to do more of it then not to try and not be upset with myself for not being able to do more than I could do. I had a couple of friends who were incredibly supportive who would take me to the infusion sessions. I know that there's some folks with some types of cancer who like go on by themselves, but afterwards I was moving very slowly, let's put it that way. So I'm really grateful to them. I also know it was really hard on my partner because I went from being the very highly energetic, active person to somebody who was grateful to be given a small chore to do, like that I could do, like going to coffee. I mean, it was that radical <laughs> of a change in my daily experience. But after a whole bunch of months, the chemo stopped and they took the pick line out. I had another colonoscopy. I had a couple of other scans in the process, MRI, and I should forget the name of the other one at the moment, but I'd rather have the scans than the colonoscopy just because the prep is so them. Yeah. Was it a CT scan? Yeah, CT scan. So I had my last colonoscopy, which was just a few months ago, was clear. So theoretically, I don't have to go back in for three years. I had another CT scan. I think I have another one of those in a year. Also, I volunteered to be part of a drug study. There are a couple of drugs that have been shown to 
decrease the formation of colon polyps in people who've never had cancer. So now they're doing a study with people who have had colon cancer to see if it's as effective for them. But it's a double blind, so I have no idea if I'm getting the drugs or I'm getting the fake pill, the fake thing on the world right now. So, but I'm doing it, and that also means I'm beginning going in every three months, pretty much anyhow to check in with the oncologist. But I think that will go on longer. The three months check-ins due to the drug study. I went in a couple of like this last week for a follow-up, and it just really started to hit me that you know chemo is a thing that happens actually after you're already quote unquote cured. The idea is for it not to go forward. There's no way to know, you know, if that's effective or not. So I think I'm going to another round right now of processing the fear that I couldn't really look at so much when I had to like get through it. I'm questioning, you know, do I change my diet yet more? Do I start using uh, marijuana concentrate as a preventative? So, you know, it doesn't really go away. It, it definitely is now part of my my lived experience and that's something I kind of am working with all the time. And how long has it been since you finished chemo? I finished chemo, I think, when did I actually finish? It was like May, because right after I finished chemo, I went back to work. I'd been back at work for two months when I got laid off, which was like, come on, universe, really? And then I started my new job in August, I believe. So it's been an adventure. So I want to go back to what you were saying about your challenge with focus, particularly around your sitting meditation practice. And I wonder if there was any other spiritual practices that you had that you felt like you could do or that were helpful or supportive. Looking back now, I think there are things I should have tried, like walking practice. But for whatever reason, I just kind of didn't. It seems so weird to me because for most of my life, I've had spiritual practices of one form and another. But I think just dealing with being in my body was my practice for the time. I think having had a practice helped a lot because I had skills around dealing with pain and being with things as they are. Early on, I did maybe a little bit of work with some of the gods and such I work with, for, you know, energy, but that went away pretty quickly. Very, it's just the way it was. Yeah, I shared in my story that it was fairly similar, but I would definitely agree with you that having the background and the years of practice in my own spiritual practice was very helpful, even though it was really hard to do those things in the moment. You know, so one of the things that was most helpful for me was actually guided meditation because then I didn't have to work so hard to stay focused. And then another thing that was really hard for me is that a big part of my life that feeds me spiritually is music and sound. And the chemo really affected a lot of my nervous system. And so listening to certain kinds of sound was just didn't feel good you know, particularly higher pitched sound. So I really only found a small handful of artists and music that I could listen to is usually like soft flute or piano music that I could really listen to and nothing else. So that totally makes sense to me. I went very much on the case of like lowering stimulation across kind of all areas. And I definitely, I often have music on pretty much all the time. And I switch to much more like Celtic music without singing, some Japanese flute, that kind of stuff, rather than my more usual, more rambunctious stuff. Yeah, definitely. Well, I thought that we would move into a couple questions that I got from social media. I solicited some questions for us, and I thought that we could just take some time both talking about or answering the questions. And yeah, one thing I talked about that I didn't hear from you, which is one of the questions is, did you seek any alternative or complementary treatment at the time? So I actually used herbs and homeopathy and acupuncture to help with a lot of the symptoms, but I'm wondering what your experience was with any of those. I used CBDs a fair amount, especially early on when I was dealing with nausea. 
went and visited dispensaries for the first time, which was pretty amazing. We tried some edibles and I got some honey. One of the symptoms I had after that halfway through is I had really terrible insomnia. At one point, I went through like four drugs in a week and a half because I'm like, I have to sleep. <laughs> and I was just, and the uh, honey with the CBD was one of the first things that I tried. One thing that I started doing near when I was kind of just coming off chemo was I went to a acupuncturist. I had done some acupuncture years ago for a knee issue and stuff like that. And I lost just tons of body tone due to having the pick line in and not being able to do anything but walk. And I was really determined to come back physically. And I was aware that my whole system was just way out of whack. So I thought I would try an acupuncturist. So I did that. I found a uh, kind of Chinese college that's local and got the name of someone who actually had worked with cancer patients before. And I really think she helped. Each time, like the day after I saw her, my energy was considerably better. And it stayed that way. So, And then I also went to see a physical therapist to help me get my body back together again in a safe manner. So, yeah, those were the main things I tried. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that a few different people asked in different ways was, what were your first thoughts when you were diagnosed and where did your mind take you? There was a bit of disbelief. Because as I mentioned, like I eat better than 90% of my friends and I get more exercise than 90% of my friends. So I'm like, how can this possibly be true? Then I remember I also grew up in the 60s when there was all kinds of horrible chemicals everywhere. And that, you know, it was probably exposure to something when I was a child that made this occur. And the, that was followed by a whole lot of anger, you know, despite the fact that I have some definite agreement with the Buddhist belief that we are all subject to all ills that humanity is subject to, and there's no reason any particular thing wouldn't happen to you, but I was still really angry. I don't think there's a rational side to that. It was just part of my big emotional response. And so that, you know, before the chemo started, that was actually where I was using my practice was to figure out how to be with the anger and let it pass and acknowledge it and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually something that a couple other people have asked me and that was not my experience. I didn't have any anger come up. It was similar to you. I had a little bit of disbelief and sort of like, why is this happening? You know, what's causing it? Because I don't know if I can say that I'm a healthier eater than 90% of my friends, but I would say I'm a pretty healthy person. You know, I do mild exercise regularly and I eat well and I haven't done a lot of, you know, used a lot of drugs or I don't smoke. I don't really drink. I barely drink coffee, <laughs> you know, all these things. And I try to eat, I eat pretty cleanly, but again, you know, who knows what was being put into the environment chemically, you know, when I was a kid in the eighties, you know, we're only just learning now what was really happening from the fifties through now in our food system. And also for me, I talked about what went through my mind was my concern about working with my clients and having to take a pause from working with them and what's going to happen to my practice. You know, is my business practice going to fall apart when I'm taking all this time off? You know, and then also before the surgery, because I'd never had surgery before, so that was really scary for me, was I wasn't particularly worried about dying, but my preparation mind kind of went into worst case scenario of like, okay, I have to have all of these things ready in case you know the work like they go in and they find more cancer and something happens and you know i'm in the hospital for longer or you know who knows what's going to happen so i was just went into preparation mode and threw a bunch of information at my husband saying okay here's what you need to know in case x y and z happens so yeah i guess i did some of that too i made i did re-update my will 
to kind of organize my files so things would be findable. I shared my password manager with my partner. Yeah. Yeah, so that stuff was there too, for sure, as a just-in-case. Another question sort of on a similar line was, did this experience bring up for you any thoughts or feelings regarding mortality in the afterlife and how you understood the universe or your divine place in it? Well, it certainly brought up plenty of fear. Like I said, I think I'm going to another round of processing that right now. I don't know that it really changed anything. I've done en- enough working with mortality and I've had several friends die in the last three, four years. And so it's given me a whole lot of opportunity to look at stuff. And I just think that starts happening more and more as we get older, right? So there's a tough part of life. So no, I don't think I've really, anything really changed. It just became a lot more in my face. And, you know, half the time I feel fairly at peace with an understanding of some sort of continuity, which I've had some experiences in my life to suggest. And sometimes like, well, you know, if it's just I become energy again as part of the world, that's not a bad thing either. And times of absolute, you know, existential panic. So <laughs> just the full gamut. <laughs> when I really sat down and thought about it in that first week, I don't know that I was so much afraid of dying in terms of like what was going to happen to me and that kind of thing because a couple years ago I had actually done a lot of work just out of curiosity and preparation to really look at my relationship to death and dying. I ended up volunteering at a hospice for a year and I took some classes with one of my spiritual teachers on death and dying and grief and loss. And so I felt that all that work really helped prepare me for this experience in that way. But I guess the one thing that I felt was, and again, it wasn't really an anger, but just kind of an unfear that if I died, it would be unfair because, you know, I'm only 41 and I, there's a lot more that I want to do with my life. So it's not a fear of what would happen after I died or dying in that way, but just like, a fear of if I die, like, it's unfair because I'm not going to get to do all the things that I want to do. I still have stuff I want to (laughs) do. Yeah, I think that big drive to keep doing all the things you want to do was a lot of what carried me through the hardest parts of chemo. Mm -hmm. It's like, I will be on the other side, I will be putting on more events, and I will be working with people and having great experiences. And that was a big driver. Yeah. Another question is, what were helpful things that people said or did or that weren't helpful? I'm especially curious, like what was helpful for you within your community or family systems? You shared a little bit about, you know, the good nurses versus the not great nurses and that kind of thing. But I'm curious, outside of the medical system, what was helpful and not helpful for you? It was really helpful, but I had a couple of friends who were actually willing to go to the hospital. I've had the experience in the past in surgery of a friend like not be willing to go into the hospital doors because of their own issues. So it was really helpful to have people. And they made a big point of saying, you know, if you need me to come to get to your house to pick you up, even if it's, you know, 15 miles out of the way, which is a, a traffic issue in the Bay Area, or just they would come over and have lunch with me occasionally because the lack of social contact definitely became a thing. And one, another thing that was helpful, even though I was really reluctant to do it, I don't post a lot of super personal stuff on Facebook, but I did have tons of people checking in on me. And so starting about halfway through the process, I would do a maybe monthly update just saying what was going on with me and test results and getting 120 people, you know, it's not a lot for some folks, but for me, it felt like a lot of people saying, you know, yay, or good to hear from you or whatever. That was felt really good in that sort of really isolated space I was in, despite having a couple of friends and a partner because, you know, she needed to take care of herself too and still do social things as well as, be a great support to me. 
And there was something about actually saying what was happening that, though hard to do, I think was useful, helped my feeling a connection to others. I did go a few times to a cancer support group. Again, it was, I didn't start till I was halfway through. That was up in Fremont. And it was really hard because like driving became really tough for me, especially when it was dark. I once had the experience of going up to the support group and I lost my car when it was time to come out because it just, it was really tough. And though they were generally much older than me and very different positions in life, it, there was something relaxing about being in a group where everybody really understood not the, what my experience had been like, you know, not that I needed to go into details all the time, but if I did say something, people were totally there and I could share that for them. So that was useful. Yeah, I actually didn't share on social media because that to me felt like I assumed it would be overwhelming to have so much response and concern and that kind of thing. So I actually only shared, you know, by email or text with people, you know, and I still let a lot of people know. And I ended up starting a Lots of Helping Hands group page as a way to keep people connected. So then people could choose if they wanted to. And I, you know, it sounds like your chemo went for seven or so months. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine was only for three. So it wasn't as long. So I didn't, like, I actually do okay, fairly well with isolation being more introverted. So three months of not doing a whole lot of socializing wasn't too bad. But similar to you, what was really helpful was people who were able to either give me rides to and from the hospital or come visit me. And a lot of the time I would tell them, you know, I probably might not want to talk or even listen to you talk, but just having you here is fine. And so they could just come and read a book. But especially the rides were really helpful because even though I'm very close to where I was getting treatment, because my sense of smell and sound and sensitivity to light was so significant, like getting on the bus was not very pleasant. Even taking like, you know, a car, like a taxi or something like that. A lot of those like Lyft or Uber people, they have a lot of sense in their car and, or they would have music on and it would just be really challenging for that 10 or 15 minute ride back to my house or to the hospital. So getting in a friend's car where I could just say, no sense, no sounds, no talking was really helpful. So That totally makes sense. Yeah. And then also just having people, you know, come visit me while I was at home or bring food was also really helpful. Yeah, people would show up with food and that was just like the sweetest thing because, yeah, I really wasn't up for doing most of that and just the warmth of the gesture was really good. For me, like the first few months, I'm also fairly introverted, so I was doing okay. But as it went longer and as the chemo effects got worse, that's when I really started to feel disconnected because I could do fewer and fewer of the things that normally feed me. So, yeah, super grateful for the friends who made phone calls or came to visit, did the rides. Yeah. As far as what wasn't helpful, the one thing that I will say that sticks out to me the most is when I did sort of send out one of those reports about how I was doing and what was going on. I had mentioned my acupuncture and homeopathy, and I had one person respond telling me how those things weren't actually effective based on studies, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was not helpful to receive that kind of judgment or criticism, especially in that state. Yeah, I'm really grateful for that. There were a couple of times people would post, oh, have you tried this or that? And then I'm like, I will strangle you through my email. But no. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. The last thing you need is somebody second guessing your choices or what conversations you've had or not had with your doctor or what things you've thought about it. Yeah, not helpful. Yeah, so I guess for anyone listening, the best thing to do is to at, just say, how can I support you? Or ask before you give advice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks, Lance, for being here and sharing your story and 
having a conversation about, you know, what was the same and what was different in our experience. On a separate note, I know that you also are one of the organizers and the founder of the South Bay Trans Day of Visibility in San Jose, California. And I wonder if you just want to share a little bit about that with our listeners. Sure. We are coming up on our 10th anniversary. We had the first Trans Day Visibility in the Bay Area, which I'm very proud of. I've been involved in Trans Day of Remembrance and such for a long time and was super excited when this idea of a trans-focused pride event came along. So I got that going at the Billy DeFrank Center in San Jose. And this year, I'm excited to report, we are moving to San Jose City Hall, which is this big, beautiful rotunda. We're going to have an art show, and we're going to have workshops of all sorts from community discussion on being an ally or what it's like in your partner transitions to some kids doing their own workshops. We'll have resource tables. Weather permitting, we'll uh, have some outdoor space where we can have some music and people will have a good time. And we'll have doors open at 12.30 on March 30th at San Jose City Hall. The day event runs till about 6 o'clock. And then at 8 o'clock, we're, those who are 21 and over are going to move to Renegades Bar, which is at 501 Taylor Street, also in San Jose, where we'll have a show and karaoke and get to do our uh, celebration part of the event. One thing that's great this year is the event at City Hall, Trans Day Visibility, is entirely free accept donations for the Billy DeFrank Center, but I'm super excited that we can make all of this open to everyone. Awesome. And is there a website where people can find all the information? Very good point. Yes, there is. It is southbaytdov.org. There's also an event on Facebook for those who do that, but southbaytdov.org is the best place to find us. You can also email us at info at southbaytdov.org. If you're interested in volunteering or presenting or just have questions, I should mention it's not just quote unquote trans people. We have programming by and for non binary people, gender queer people, asexual people are welcome. Basically, all the sort of gender expansive folks and all of their friends and allies and people who want to learn are very welcome to attend and enjoy the event. Great. Well, I will put all those links and information in the show notes for people to find them. And hopefully you'll get a great turnout. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, thanks for being here. And I will be in touch with you soon. Thanks very much. I'm really looking forward to hearing the show. It's good to chat with you. Do you feel lost or stuck? Or are you alone on your healing journey? If you're seeking guidance or support, I'm here to help. I offer online coaching and counseling for queer spiritual folks from all over. Schedule your free consultation with me now by going to QueerHealingJourneys.com. I look forward to supporting you on your path. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at TheQueerSpirit.com. And if you enjoyed the show, remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. This will help us reach and support more queer people all over. Thanks for listening and see you next time.